It's getting there. Now we got a little bit better. Paul's back there telling me to keep talking so he can get it adjusted. He's, that's usually not a problem for me to be talking. This morning, we're going to be looking at Ruth chapter 4. So you'll want to turn to Ruth chapter 4 in your Bibles. I'm actually turning somewhere else for a moment here. As the Spirit moved, I'll try to stay on track. There's so much in this chapter that we can look at, and the Lord keeps prompting me, or my scattered brain keeps working and churning, so I'll try to stay close to my notes, make sure that we stay there, but did want to bring up a passage here at the beginning in just a moment. Remember, you know, previously on Dean's sermon series, right, the sort of uh, recap of where we've been, we've looked at Ruth chapter 1, three weeks ago now, Ruth chapter 1, where we saw Ruth acting not just good, her sister-in-law, Orpah, obeyed her mother-in-law and went home like she was supposed to. Ruth did better than good in family matters, devoting herself to Yahweh and you know, the God of Scripture, the one true God, and to her mother-in-law, so better than good here, the better than we could expect. And so we had better than good in family matters. The second week in Ruth chapter 2, we had better than good. I should see if you can remember. Better than good at work. Right. I'm sure many of you were thinking that. Better than good at work as we saw Boaz caring for Ruth, a Moabite widow who was sojourning in the land of Israel. And she... He was good to, we might say, a refugee. He's good to someone who was coming through the country, had chosen to come and live in Israel because she devoted herself to Yahweh. He cared for her like family. We learn that he is family as well, related to Naomi, not Ruth, there. And then in chapter 3, we saw that uh, Boaz and Ruth were both better than good in a sexually charged culture, culture just like we live in. Uh, an opportunity for them in the middle of the night in a place where this kind of thing happens, uh, they were in that culture, that climate, sexually charged time, they were better than good and remained chaste and pure in that uh, uh, threshing floor out in the field that night. Today we're looking at better than good in legal matters. Interesting here, better than good in legal matters. I should say it could be interesting. As soon as I said legal matters, some of you may have glazed over. It's a fascinating story here. It begins back in chapter 3, but before we actually turn to Ruth 4, I'm going to read from Psalm 19 just to think about law a little bit differently. Right? Ruth, uh, I'm sorry, Psalm 19, I'll just read from verse 7 and following. <clears throat> the law of the Lord is perfect. Refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. Six statements on God's law that celebrate God's law. As Christians, we often think, well, God's law is oppressive. We're in grace now. We're free from the law, right? The psalmist here is praising God for his law and all the ways that it helps us and serves us. If I could preach a second sermon this morning before the sermon, it would be on the value of God's law because we're going to see Boaz as better than good in relation to God's law. In fact, the psalmist wraps it up by saying, they, they, the laws, the precepts, ordinances, commands, all the synonyms for law there, they are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They're sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them is your servant warned, and in keeping them, there is great reward. As we look into Ruth chapter 4 and think about how Boaz was faithful, was better than good in legal matters, let's look to the Lord and let him speak to us this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful 
that in a chapter that goes so many different directions and ways here, we see this clear message that your law, when followed, leads to abundant life. You've saved us, you've given us this life, and then you've said, walk in this life, live this life, and you've given us a scripture full of commands. And Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commandments. And in that we may have life to the full. So I pray that we'd understand that this morning in the many ways you give it to us in Ruth chapter 4. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this morning, Ruth chapter 4, I'm going to begin back in chapter 3. I mentioned this. I mentioned it last week. This is sort of a wink toward the future chapter 4 here. But in Ruth chapter 3 and verse 12... We saw in the middle of this romance, in the middle of this story that you thought was about to bring about the marriage of Ruth and Boaz that we've been anticipating since the beginning of chapter 2, just when you thought this was going to be cared for in the threshing floor, Boaz and Ruth were better than good, and they would not sleep together until they were married. Our culture has missed completely that concept. Right? It just isn't part of the thought of our culture anymore that you have to wait until marriage. But Boaz and Ruth, both following God's commandments, following God's law, but Boaz mentions something here in verse 12 of chapter 3. Although it is true that I am a family guardian, a kinsman redeemer, there is another who is more closely related than I. Now, fascinating there, better than good, Right? Because Boaz, in the days of the judges, <clears throat> I'm going to keep my water uncorked here, ready to go. Better than good, in the days of the judges, when everyone does what's right in their own eyes, Boaz could first just take Ruth in the field, could have his way with her, and no one would care. You just studied Judges, you know the end of the book of Judges and the ways in which this all goes horribly wrong. When everyone does what's right in their own eyes, Boaz says, you know, there's a law in the Old Testament that says a family member should take care of a widow in the family. And in fact, we see this in other parts of Scripture where, for instance, uh, Judah, when his first son dies, his wife is given to his second son in order to produce heirs for the name of that first son. This lover right marriage. It's something we don't have in our Christian traditions. It's, it doesn't follow from Jewish culture to Christian culture in the Old Testament, New Testament. But God did this to care for widows, as we're seeing in the book of Ruth. And Boaz could have simply said, tomorrow, you know, let's avoid sexual sin tonight, but tomorrow... Let's go quick get married. The judges are at the city gate. We can do that. It's no big deal. And then it'll be fine. But Boaz is better than good. There is someone closer in line who has an opportunity to obey God's law and be blessed here. Even though he wants to marry Ruth, she wants to marry him. Naomi really wants this whole thing to happen, right? We saw that in chapter 3. Boaz is better than good in legal matters. He says, you know what, there's, a, there's an order here to the family, and I need to give that first right of refusal to a family member. There's somebody else closer than I am. That sets us up for chapter 4, and we begin in verse 1 of chapter 4. Meanwhile, well, Naomi, or, uh, Ruth went home to Naomi, Boaz went to the town gate. And he sat down there just as the family guardian he had mentioned came along. And Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the family guardian, Naomi has come back from Moab. She is selling a piece of land that belonged to her. To our relative and belong to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me and I will know, for no one has the right to do this except you, but I'm next in line. Now, kind of a complicated story, but if you think of that Leverite marriage, that family relationship, not only the, the widow, but the land, anything that was in that inheritance would come to that 
kinsman redeemer, that person who would step in and care for this widow. Now, a little business savvy here, right? Boaz doesn't mention Ruth. That'll come later, but he mentions this field. Do you want a new field? It's part of the family. You can have it if you want it. You have the right. I don't. Better than good in legal matters. This is risky because that guy actually steps up in the next verse and says, I will redeem it. Right? Boaz may lose out on not only the land, but his romance that's been developing with Ruth. Risky sometimes to follow God's law, to go countercultural. In his culture, he could have just taken the land. He could have just, nobody would, they'd have thought, oh, wow, he beat me to the punch. You know, that's fine. He, I had the right. But uh, days of the judges, everyone does what's right in their own eyes. Just like in our culture, everyone does what's right in their own eyes. He says, you know, the law of the Lord is good. It refreshes us. It protects us. It serves us if we'll just submit to it. And he does so in this very technical way. Uh, Interesting here, uh, back in chapter 3, you know, at this point we wonder, if this were a movie, if this were a novel, did we just go in a, a, a bad direction? If this ends with the kinsman redeemer buying the land and inheriting Ruth in the process, the whole romance that's been set up, Ruth, the main character that's been on the scene and paid so much money to be in the movie, you know, all of that, she needs to end up with Boaz, doesn't she? This is a real plot twist when you get here. Boy, there's a kinsman. We thought it was done in chapter 3, but there's a, a catch. There's more complication. And now the kinsman is volunteering to do this. But Boaz, not only better than good here related to the law, but he's a little bit business savvy, right? He's a little shrewd in this business deal. He offers the kinsman the land. He says, sure, I want the land. Let me redeem it. Then Boaz says, great, <laughs> right? Verse 5, then Boaz said, on the day that you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite. In fact, interesting, the Moabite gets added back in there. This is souring the deal, right? Does this other kinsman really want to attach himself to a Moabite woman, right? We've talked about Moabites before. There's a whole uh, shadow over this. Do you, you, there's more than you bargained for here, right? It's almost a bait and switch. Right? He's going to be honest. He's not going to let him sign the deal and then, you know, trick him, hoodwink him here, but he does save that for this key moment in the negotiation. You acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, at this, the family guardian said, then I cannot redeem it because it might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I can't do, I cannot do so. I won't. Now, interesting, this other kinsman we could see as a bad guy here, the story doesn't read that way. In fact, I don't know if you noticed back uh, in verse 1, Boaz had said to the kinsman, the other kinsman, come over here, my friend, and sit down. My friend is kind of a nice family, kind of a, a friendly greeting. Uh, any other translations there in verse 1? Come over here, my friend, the NIV says. What's that? Turn aside. What does it call the person, though? Does it, it doesn't give a name, a friend. Yeah. A couple different translations handle it a couple different ways. In Hebrew, it really is sort of a euphemism to hide the name of the kinsman, right? He's, he has the legal right to marry Ruth and to claim this land, but he is not obligated if someone else in the family is willing. So when he says, I can't do it, it'll, it'll uh, threaten my inheritance here, my, my estate, uh, maybe he's got several sons and he doesn't have that much land and so his estate will be divided up in the next generation in a way that if he marries Ruth and she has a lot of sons, then all of a sudden his estate gets divided many more ways. So it might be a real uh, risk here, a real threat. Interesting, Boaz doesn't care about the risk. He's going to be better than good and marry this Moabite woman because she's now Israelite even though she was born Moabite, ethnicity isn't the issue here. She worships Yahweh. But uh, back uh, that my friend, in Hebrew, that's, 
means so-and-so. Polani, it's a, it's a term that's kind of uncommon, but it's just saying, you know, he saw this guy whose name is, you know, whatever, <laughs> so-and-so. Let's not put shame on him and his family for the rest of the Old Testament for all time recorded here, because what he's doing isn't wrong. It's just not better than good, right? He just sets it aside and says, no, you can have that land. I can't threaten my own estate. Boaz is ready to step up. If you don't do it, I will. And so once Ruth's in the equation, the kinsman waves his right. Not a problem. That's good. That's fine. He's protecting his inheritance because someone else is going to obey. But Boaz steps up. Boaz is better than good. He's going to follow this this uh, Leverite law from Deuteronomy that we're going to care for widows by making sure they stay in the family, make sure that they have inheritance, and make sure that the family name of Malon is pre- preserved here, Bo- uh, Elimelech's son. So, better than good here in legal matters. And if you want to think farther than just legal matters, this is really technical, Right? This is really specific. Most of you probably weren't familiar with the Leverite Law and all the things legally in the background here, but Boaz knows God's Word. When everyone else in Judges doesn't seem to know God's Word and seems to do all kinds of crazy things in the culture, Boaz seems to understand God's Word and say, there's an an obligation here. Someone in the family needs to do this, and it's a risk. It's a a big obligation, but it's God's law, and I'm going to obey it because there's blessings. The law of the Lord is perfect. It refreshes my soul. I'm going to obey it no matter what. Now, we continue to read. Um, I'm going to skip verse 7 and come back to it. Verse 8, so the family guardian said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal, which is the way you uh, sign a contract at this time in history. Then Boaz announced to the elders, And all the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. Right? They're all three dead. The father, the two sons there from the first few verses of the book. Um, And I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. This isn't my inheritance I'm gaining with this field and with this wife. This is all to preserve Elimelech's family line and his son's line, Malon, to make sure that they have this inheritance. In order to maintain the name of the dead and with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown, today you are witnesses. Right? Boaz doing better than good. He's doing this right, not out in the the threshing floor last night, not hoodwinking this guy that he's, you know, tricking him out. He's doing everything meticulously according to God's law and trusting God for the process and what will follow for the results. He's doing what's better than good here. The men of the town, the elders here, verse 11 The elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May Yahweh make the woman who is coming to your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. Let me pause at each one of these just to refresh your memory. Jacob was the one who married Leah by mistake and Rachel a week later, and then their maidservants get involved and they have 12 sons. All four of those. It's a crazy story. If you want to go back and read a crazy story, go back to Genesis and read that text. Uh, But in the process, Rachel and Leah produced 12 sons, and they are the foundation of Israel. Jacob's name is changed to Israel, and they are the 12 tribes of Israel. So that whole background is here, and the town people are saying, may you be like the new patriarch, Boaz. May you be like Interesting, Jacob's name doesn't appear. He wasn't all that great of a character. Again, if you want to read a shady character, go back there. He's not better than good. Uh, In maybe any of the stories, he's not better than good. In fact, we have trouble calling him good in some stories. But, so let's not think of his name, but Rachel and Leah, may Ruth be like them in producing a whole nation of people coming from you. Interesting. You'll be the next Jacob. You'll be the patriarch here. 
His name is kind of hinted at when it's house of Israel because Jacob's name was changed to Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. The whole book has all kinds of uh, hints of Genesis. This is one you may not remember. Anybody remember? I'm really curious. Anybody remember who Perez is in the Old Testament? Joe, my Hebrew student. I, sorry to claim that from you, but yeah. Joe got it. Any, nobody else remember? Anyone remember Tamar? Now some of you are in that. That's a crazy story. Genesis 38. I'll even point out the chapter there if you want to go back later. Not now. Not while I'm preaching. But later and read Genesis. Fascinating detail here because this is the family story of Judah. And Judah has three sons. Judah actually left the family. He rebelled after he sold Joseph into slavery. Probably some guilt-related stuff there. His dad still won't give him attention. So he goes and marries a Canaanite woman and raises three children there who are being raised in that Canaanite culture more than in Yahweh's culture. And, but when the first son dies, before he can have children, somehow he does not yet have children, Tamar, the wife of that first son, is given to the second son. And when the second son refuses to obey his duties here in that love-right marriage, caring for the widow of his brother, when he refuses to do that, the Lord takes his life. He dies. And so here is Tamar, strike one and strike two, right? Two husbands died. She doesn't have any children. Uh, Judah's not going to swing at the third pitch here, right? <laughs> Judah withholds his third son. It says he's too young. Wait a while till he's older, hoping Tamar will just kind of fade from the scene. Jacob, or Judah, sorry, is not going to follow this Leverite law. He's doing what he thinks is preserving his family line. Logic would dictate that, but God's law says, no, we do this. So he's not better than good. Judah withholds that third son, and I won't spoil the whole story other than to say that uh, uh, Judah's at fault here, but uh, ends up sleeping with Tamar, his daughter-in-law, unknowingly, crazy, I could spend another hour talking about all that stuff. But he, he sleeps with Tamar, and Tamar then produces an heir for Judah's line. You know, very weird story, right? When we step off of God's plan, when we violate God's laws, God's intentions in our lives, life crashes. We think it's for the benefit. Culture tells us it's the good thing to do. Preserve your own finances. Don't give to others. Right? Don't support that person in need. Don't take on an obligation. But when we follow God's law and are generous and care for others, in legal matters here, when we follow that law, it blesses us. And there, the men of the town are saying, may you be blessed, in fact, have standing in Ephrathah. There's a great uh, thing there. I'm, I'm being conscious of the time. Um, may you have standing Remember, Boaz was a man of standing in, the first, in chapter 2, verse 1. And Ruth was a woman of noble character. Same word in Hebrew, same word you used here. May you, in this union, have standing. May you be honorable. May God honor you for obeying him. So, may you have standing. May you be like the family of Perez, who follows Judah's line and produces heirs of Judah. Now, some of you are biblically literate enough. Many of this culture are not yet, so if you're not, just keep reading Scripture voraciously, keep reading it thoughtfully. But Judah's line is going to produce a very key heir, and we are going to get there in the story if I keep moving forward. So let me remove the first page of notes so I do move forward. In uh, verse 13, everything speeds up. Right? We've had this night on the threshing floor that took a whole chapter. We've had this morning court scene that's taken 12 verses to unpack. So Boaz took Ruth home, and she became his wife. And when he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and to give birth to a son. Well, we've got a whole year packed into that verse. 
right? They went home, got, they got married there, they went home, they had a son, and he's born. I mean, this all comes up in one verse. Um, it is interesting in a sex-crazed culture in this period of the judges, it, it really doesn't follow modern movies in that it understates the sex scene, right? I mean, it just goes by in a phrase. They uh, got into the family way here, right? It just kind of glosses it, and they produce a son. So, very quickly moves us right on to verse 14. The women said to Naomi, when the son is born, Praise be to Yahweh, praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a family guardian, a kinsman redeemer in Boaz who produced this son who will carry on the family line and the inheritance and all that comes with it. May he, this son, be famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life. Renew your life. Remember that Psalm 19? The law of the Lord renews our life. He will renew your life, or may he renew your life, and sustain you in your old age. For the daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better than you, better than good wasn't my clever phrase, it's right here in Ruth, right? <laughs> better than you here, or better to you than, I'm sorry, better to you than seven sons, better than good. Seven sons would be great. She's better to you than that because she's given birth to a son. She has preserved your family line. So important in an ancient agricultural society. God does what's best for them in his law for them. And they have followed it here and are better than good. And then Naomi the child, took the child in her arms and cared for him. Some of your translations will say, placed the child on her lap. That would be an ancient way of saying she's going to care for him. Uh, it, the NIV here takes what we might take, you know, take that baby in your arms and, and hold that baby and rock that baby and she's not going to nurse that baby physically here, but she is going to be the caregiver for this baby for Ruth and Boaz. And that seems a little weird. In fact, uh, any of you have mother and mothers-in-law that are a little, you know, clinging to those kids and want to have more influence than you want in their life, right? I mean, that's all going on here, but it's a good thing. If we keep reading, Naomi took the child, and the woman living there said, Naomi has a son. Naomi has a son. Ruth has a son. What are you? Naomi, interesting, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed, okay? Naomi, remember chapter 1? At the end of chapter 1, Naomi was bitter, literally bitter. She said, my name means pleasant. Don't call me Naomi. Don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. Call me Marah. I'm no longer pleasant here. I'm bitter because Yahweh has afflicted me, right? Maybe clinging to Yahweh's sovereignty, but she's not at all happy about it. She is upset that she, in fact, she says in chapter 1, I left Bethlehem full. But I came back empty, right? I went away full. I came back empty. Now Naomi has a son. In fact, a son here because of a daughter-in-law from Moab who was better than good. And because of a son-in-law now in uh, uh, Boaz here who was better than good in legal matters, followed this to the detailed. And interesting, as we think about, she had a son who now is better than seven sons. Well, seven's a big number in the Old Testament, right? Seven comes up often. We think of it as a holy number and so on. Um, more numbers are going to come up here as we keep reading. But they are blessed more than, better than if they had seven sons. Here is this heir. And in fact, the author's not going to let you miss it. How is this better than seven sons? Because they named him Obed, and he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now we know why we have this story in Scripture, right? Why did God inspire this wonderful story and example for our lives? That's good enough. But it's important here in the time of the judges that there is a family in Israel who is going to live better than good. There is a family that not only is going to be blessed by living better than good and by having an heir to carry on the family line, 
But that family line is going to produce King David. A lot more we could say about that. I'm going to move on to the application here because we're applying not just chapter 4. We're going to start there, but we need to apply the whole book here as I wrap up the message this morning. So, there's a surprise ending here. Again, I've compared this to a movie sometimes uh, here with you because that's our medium for storytelling these days. Uh, the way the plot is twisted in chapter 3 and all of these things, tragedy in chapter 1 kind of hooks you into how's this going to resolve and then a plot twist going into chapter 4 with a different kinsman. At the end of the movie, there's a cameo, right? There's a famous character, a famous actor here who comes on the scene, and it's David. The story's not going to get there, but we get a foreshadowing of David is coming. What's the problem in Judges? Why did everyone do what's right in their own eyes? Anyone know that last verse of Judges? I'm letting you peek if you're looking in your Bible. I see a couple people looking back. Why does everyone do what's right in their own eyes? Because there's no king in the land. There's no one like Moses or Joshua to set the tone following Yahweh in a way that the whole nation will follow. There are judges, and they rescue Israel when they're in crisis after they fall, but we need to get ahead of the game and not fall anymore. We need to follow an example here. There's no king in the land, and that's why everyone seems to do what's right in their own eyes. A king is coming here. David is coming. So, application just for this chapter first how are you better than good in legal matters? And I'm going to challenge you, not just in our societal law, sometimes that follows God's law, follows the Ten Commandments in some ways, but not others. But how do we follow God's law? I don't think, we, we tend to skip over the end of Exodus and Leviticus and some of Numbers and then a lot of Deuteronomy because there's so many laws in there. And many of them apply to ancient Israel. Right? The Leverite marriage is not something that we see in the New Testament carried on. There's a whole different family structure there, and we're to care for widows and orphans in the body of Christ, in the community here. And there's a whole separate thing going on with church in Israel. And some of those laws are, are merely affecting that, right? There's no law probably in our culture formally that says if your ox knocks down your neighbor's fence, you have to pay for it. And if it knocks down the neighbor's fence next week, you have to give the neighbor the, the ox. It's his now because you were negligent. We have laws based on that, but those are ancient laws. We, they set up justice. They set up what God has as a bigger ethic for life. That's what Boaz and Ruth are following throughout this book. And that is what is going to bless their life. Better than seven sons as heirs because they are going to lead to King David. How are you? living better than good? How are you following God's justice, God's law, God's ethic in your life? I'm going to leave that just with you, not even give examples from my life, but the more we study God's law, the more we understand it like the psalmist, that this benefits us. Even in ways that are very countercultural. this benefits us, and we ought to follow God's ethic when our world, because there is no king like David on the throne, we don't follow God's law. We have trouble all through our history of going there, and now even more so. So how do you do this? And then let me cover the last few chat verses here because it wraps up the whole book. It's kind of set apart. Comparing it to a movie again, what happens at the end of a movie? The credits roll, right? You get a list of all these people, most of them you don't know. Right? The first couple you know because they're famous actors and then there are supporting actors and then there's some people who had cameos that'll say, you know, with this person. Not, they just got hired in for this one scene kind of thing. And then it'll go on to the grips and the cameraman, all these people you don't know. Well, that's the way this ends, only not with uh, credits rolling, but a genealogy. That's the Old Testament version of credits here, right? A genealogy. This, then, is the family line of Perez. Remember, Perez is in Judah's line. So we're going down the line of Judah here. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amminadab. Amminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father, father of Solomon. Right At this point, you're thinking we're down to the grip. We're people in the movie, right? We don't know any of these people. Solomon, the father of Boaz. Oh, there we are. Now we know Boaz from this book. 
And Boaz, the father of Jesse, and that name rings a bell because Jesse is the father of David. Now, if you think genealogy is the way an Old Testament audience would, sevens and tens are important in genealogies. In Genesis, when we have a genealogy of Adam, it leads to Enoch as the seventh person. And Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. Right? There's this whole different kind of life for Enoch. He walked with God. Everybody else lived, had kids, died. He walked with God. And then the tenth one in the genealogy is Noah, who's going to be the redeemer in that generation. Here, we have the seventh one being Boaz. You can go back and count it if you want. I did. Right? It's numbers, so I always have to count twice. But Boaz is the seventh, and David is the tenth in this genealogy. That's significant. It's talking about that holy and whole fulfillment that's coming because they followed God's law, because they did what was better than good. Not just better than good in the eyes of the culture, but better than good in God's eyes in following God's law, that we have this. And it goes back to that Naomi having the son. She went away empty, now she is full. John 10.10, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly, if you're in the King James, or in the NIV, have it to the full, right? Do you want abundant life? Do you want life better, uh, intrinsically better than the unsaved world around us? We live in America where most people live well, not all. There's, there's plenty of opportunity for tech justly and plenty of, plenty of opportunity to help the needy. But we live in a standard of living that's just beyond most of the world. That's fine, but there's more to life than that. Are we going to live better than good, whether it's financially wise or not? I mean, Boaz, this is risky. Really? I'm going to inherit a widow here who's going to split up my inheritance? The other kinsman says, nope, culture says I need the money. I need the inheritance. Or are you going to use that inheritance for good, for the future, for others? Are you going to be better than good in family matters? This family ends up with King David in its lineage. Are you going to be better than good in your work? Boaz gives away his wealth in giving to this widow and her family, even though he's not formally a kinsman yet. He's in the family. He's just going to do this. Are you going to be better than good in a sexually charged culture? Or are you going to be better than good at actually reading God's word and saying, you know, as Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. What are the commandments of Jesus? A small group at our, my home church did a whole year study on the commandments of Jesus. If we're loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and strength, do we even know what the commandments of Jesus are? <laughs> do we even know how they come out of the Old Testament? The law of the Lord is perfect if we'll obey it and be better than good, better than expected, better than intuitively we think, because God says so, he will fulfill us. He will bring blessings. The subheading for my sermon series was the blessings of a faithful life. We see the happy ending in this story because they have all taken risks to live better than good in God's eyes. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord today. Our Heavenly Father, you have both encouraged us, you've even entertained us in this story, and you have shown us a life that's better than good, a life where we have life to the full, we have life overflowing, abundant life. But that life bears some responsibility on us to follow Jesus, to follow his commands, to follow the way Scripture talks about good and bad and right and wrong in ways that goes way beyond culture that actually may look, make us look strange or risky in the eyes of culture that we would put you ahead of self and as we love you with all our heart and soul and strength that we would also love our neighbor better than self that we would love our neighbor as ourself do for them rather than ourself May you use this great commandment and its corollary here to love one another in ways that are better than good. In Jesus' name, amen.